So about a hundred years ago, uh, Edmund Hubble was observing distant galaxies and made a very uh, interesting observation based on his data, which showed that the universe is expanding. And uh, if you take that thought and uh, you know going backwards in time, it also means that the universe has started at some point. And that's what we call the Big Bang now. So it's really started uh, with, with these observations. Um, and over the last many decades, we have put up a model called the Lambda CDN model that really seems to, to be explaining well the expansion of the universe, the formation of structures and so forth. But now we have different probes at which we can measure the expansion of the universe. And now we're going back to measure what is the expansion of the universe, this constant that we call the Hubble constant now. You have been working many, many years on this, and it seems to be contradiction between the different probes. And uh, is that a hint for new physics, or can you explain where, where this problem is? Yeah, we're at a very interesting juncture right now, because you're correct. We have many different ways now of measuring the expansion rate. So we're talking about measuring the expansion rate locally at the current time. And it's been, ever since Hubble made his first measurements, something that has turned out to be much more difficult to measure than Hubble originally thought. Because there are all sorts of potential systematic effects that make it challenging to measure this quantity ac accurately. So a few decades ago, uh, Hubble measured a value of 500 for the Hubble constant in units of kilometers per second per megaparsec. And then that narrowed. People started to argue about whether the Hubble constant was 50 or 100. And they argued about that for a few decades. And, and then we had the Hubble Space Telescope. It was launched in 1990. And my group, the Hubble Key Project group, used the Hubble Space Telescope to measure the expansion rate using a number of different methods, including the Cepheid variables that was one of the methods that Hubble used to discover the expansion. Can you explain how that, how that works? The Cepheids themselves? Yeah. Sure. So the, an astronomer by the name of Henrietta Leavitt discovered that there was a relationship between how bright these stars are and their periods of variation. So these are supergiant stars whose atmospheres are actually in motion, they're pulsating, and the rate at which they're pulsating is correlated with their luminosity. And so it is one of the best means that astronomers have of measuring distances to objects. So you measure the luminosity in, say, the Milky Way, where you could use a geometric technique to measure absolute luminosities, and you compare the period luminosity relation in another galaxy and the inverse square law of light will then give you the distance modulo the kinds of systematic effects that make this so challenging. So just to understand, so you're, you're, you're observing these pulsating stars and then you measure the, the period and from that you can infer what is the true luminosity of this star. You go out and measure, well maybe you will, you will definitely see it dimmer and from the inverse square law, you can infer what is the distance to this star, right? Correct. And you so have you to have... calibrate that, and that's what you said you do. You use this geometrical or this uh, triangulation uh, method, right. which only works for, like, if you're lucky that there is a star that's pulsating nearby, right? Uh, part of this cosmic ladder of how you're building up distances, is that? that that's correct. And so. For example, when we want to measure out to cosmological distances, neither the Cepheids nor these geometric measurements that can be made only in the Milky Way to high accuracy can't be applied to the Type 1a supernovae. So we build up a ladder. Nearby we use geometric parallaxes or other geometric techniques. Then we use telescopes like Hubble to measure Cepheids in the way Hubble did, or red giant branch stars, which our group has been doing. And then we tie into the supernovae and the supernovae give us relative distances. We can see because the luminosity of you know, one object is, is fainter than a, another object, we get a relative distance, but we need an absolute calibration to give the Hubble constant the current expansion rate. So we have to build up this ladder. Supernovae by themselves won't do it. So the, so the supernova is really like the famous you know, 
like an example of, of uh, objects that we know are standard candles, right? That has been used for, cos for cosmology yeah. over many years now. And you're saying that they has been calibrated to the Cephites, which then has been calibrated with geometry. That's, uh, that's correct. That's and really a step that you have to go out every time you, you go out. You have to you're... use this step. There's yeah. no way right now of going from locally out to uh, cosmologically interesting. So distances. if you make one mistake or one bias or something doing it that propagates stepping, out. it propagates out. Yeah. That's correct. That's correct. Which is why, so we used uh, Hubble to measure the expansion rate to try and overcome this factor of two uncertainty, but we used five different methods to try and, and average over any kind of systematic issues that might be in one method or another. So we're using astrophysical objects. It's not like a physics experiment where we can go into a laboratory and tune our equipment and change the conditions and see what happens if you probe you know, one parameter or another. We're using these astrophysical objects. We observe them, right? It's not mm. an experiment. It's, uh, these are astronomical observations. Mm. And so we can devise tests. You know, for example, how does the abundance in the atmospheres of these Cepheids, how does that affect their luminosities? We know that they're located in regions where there's dust, which is one of the issues that Hubble was unable to correct for the presence of dust. And that, of course, is going to affect you in a systematic way because dust will always make your object look fainter. It's going to take so it looks away. like it's further away than further it really away, is. Further away, that will make the Hubble constant yeah. seem smaller. So, so it's a it's a challenge exercise to yeah. measure yeah. this yeah. with high precision. And that's so with the, the Hubble Key Project and getting above the Earth's atmosphere with the Hubble Space Telescope for the first time, we were able to settle to resolve this factor of two discrepancies. So we measured a Hubble constant to ten percent accuracy. That has held with time mm. to the accuracy that we were able to measure. And I think it held because we really did pay attention to the systematics. So a Hubble, so it's like to, to measure the expansion of the universe, it's not enough just to measure distance. You also have to measure a velocity right, mm -hmm. of those objects. How is that done? The velocities are actually simpler. So <clears throat> we use the spectrum. We can compare the spectral lines in the objects that we're interested in compared to laboratory measurements. You measure a displacement and the wavelength of these spectral lines, and then you know, it's proportional. That, uh, and that will give you, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so the discrepancy is coming when you're comparing with a completely different probe, the CMB. Is that? That's, that's yeah. correct. So now, now, so most of the measurements of the Hubble constant have been made locally. So you yeah. measure the distances <clears throat> to galaxies, you measure their velocities, the slope of that relation gives you the Hubble constant. And in the last few years, it's been possible to make much more accurate measurements of fluctuations in the temperature of the cosmic microwave background. So, and in addition to the temperature, also the polarization. And so you can fit a model, this lambda cosmological constant, cold dark matter model, and that fits the fluctuation, the power spectrum of these fluctuations extremely well. So now seven peaks that have been extremely well measured, maybe even nine at this point. And different experiments, different microwave background experiments are measuring the same peaks and they're getting very consistent answers. And when you fit these peaks to the, uh, the model with six parameters. The Hubble constant's not one of those six, but it's a very prescriptive model. So you fit the peaks. This is, uh, these are fluctuations that are occurring 380,000 years after the Big Bang, but then you can infer what the current expansion rate would be because this model is, is a predictive model that lets you infer the expansion rate today. So you compare what you get from the microwave background with what you get locally, say, from the Cepheids, and those don't agree. So it's as if so you know, you can, <clears throat> you're, tr you're trying to connect, it's one universe, but exactly, it's yeah, yeah, exactly. and you That's would expect that they would meet and they yeah. would agree. So we can think about like if we have the Big Bang here and we have the CMB, you know, the surface that we see right after, we tune our cosmological model that we basically, you know, have, have made to work with this to describe the whole evolution of the universe. We tune it, we anchor it to what we see at the CMB, and we connect it with the local you know, properties uh, right now. And the value that we see that have been calculated based on the CMB is simply different from the one that you go out and measure in our local u u universe Correct. here. So what you get from the microwave background observations mm. is a value closer to 67, and then the Cepheid variables give something like 73. 
So that's a difference of six kilometers per second per megaparsec. And that seems small compared to 50 and 100, which is where we started with before <laughs> Hubble was launched. But the issue now is that the observations have gotten much more accurate. And particularly because the microwave background, the model, Lambda CDM, if you fit the fluctuations, if that's the correct model, then the value of the Hubble constant you would infer has a precision of better than 1%. It's mm. 0.5 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And so if you can measure, say, the Hubble constant locally to the percent level, then that is a, people are now saying, a five sigma discrepancy, which is the gold standard in particle physics, right? If you have a measurement to five sigma, then that's a solid yeah, measurement. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that would imply new fundamental physics, something missing from the Lambda CDM model. But you can also see, like the when you think about the cosmological model, it's really that the, the, like a description of the universe on the larger scales, and now we are sitting and making measurements on very very local scales that we already know that there are big fluctuations, you know, the cosmic web, and you know, so so is there reason to th think that the measuring that we are doing right here, you know, should be the same as the average value over the entire universe? Well, it's an interesting question to ask, right? So one of the things that the supernova observations have done, so those have really reached the point now where you have over a thousand supernovae and counting. And so you can measure these, the Hubble diagram as a function of redshift up to fairly high redshift and, and measure the scatter very accurately, right, in the dispersion in the Hubble diagram. So if there are big fluctuations, right, big motions, different regions of the sky doing different things, you can put a constraint on that now that's actually pretty robust. You're, you're not allowed to have big fluctuations, right? These are less than percent differences that we're seeing as you go out to higher redshift. And so this was actually an issue when we were debating about whether the Hubble constant might be 50 or 80. This was in the 1980s. And, and then you could say, well, suppose that we're living in a region of the universe that's less dense than the average mm -hmm. density of the universe, so that locally you might have a higher rate of higher expansion. expansion yeah. So you're not measuring the true global mm -hmm. value. But now the type 1a supernova observations, you know, there's so many of them, the scatter is so small, you, you're just not allowed to have a variation that's that big. So, so the constraints on that particular kind of question have gotten much firmer. And it doesn't appear as that that would explain it. But when you're trying to, and also people have done simulations, given the large scale structure of the universe, could you have a difference of six Simulations kilometers? of the universe and the supercomputer, putting yourself different exactly. places and yeah. see if the local you know, change in the expansion could account for this. That's right. But, but apparently not. But it so cannot account for a difference yeah. that's this large. And so, so what are the different, you know, models that people are putting out to explain this, I, I guess there are two different camps. People that are trying to change the cosmological model, uh, the properties probably at very early times, the CMB, right? And then you and then you people like yourself that are, you know, concerned with the real observations and, and, and you see real challenges in establishing this cosmic ladder. Yeah. So so how is this working with uh, with these two different so, ways yeah, of you know, approaching it, the problem? My own view right now is I think this is an open question. I think okay. it's a really interesting question. It's very exciting, potentially new physics to be discovered, and we don't know yet how this will resolve. So you're correct. I think there are two possibilities. One is someone's going to come up with a really good idea of what physically could explain this tension, if it's real. And the other is that either there's something we don't yet understand, something we haven't correctly accounted for, some kind of systematic effect. And, and we don't know yet what that might be, but there are several potential issues that could be the problem. So, okay, what if it's real? Let's say that there are no systematic effects at this level and, and what we're seeing is a very real difference. People have spent a lot of time now trying to come up with models that would explain the difference. And there are over a thousand papers on the archive <laughs> that have attempted to explain this yeah. difference. And what I find particularly interesting is that it's turned out to be very hard to find something that can explain a discrepancy of this kind. So one of the issues is that the, the data have gotten so good for the microwave background, mm. for supernovae, for measurements of the matter density on large scales, that the, the peaks in the acoustic oscillation mm -hmm. spectrum that have been so well measured with the microwave background 
very hard to introduce new physics that wouldn't affect the positions or the heights or the, you know, the... the I can positions. imagine it's very easy to come up with a model that fixes the H naught, but then you're going to change something else gonna, and you cannot... That's uh, you right. Know, describe, you you yeah. can't just torque one thing. One without thing without destroying the whole... Uh, somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. And so one, early on, one of the explanations that was favored is maybe you have another type of neutrino, maybe a sterile neutrino that could explain things. But th that actually does affect the positions mm -hmm. and the heights of these peaks, and so you don't have that freedom mm -hmm. to do that. And then there's another discrepancy that has to do with fluctuations of the matter density, something that people call sigma-8 or S8. And if you try and explain the tension in the Hubble constant, you make the slight discrepancy with the matter density even worse. So you can't there's not one fix that will solve both of these issues. So now what people have tended to favor in the last few years is something that's being referred to as early dark energy. So this happens very early in, in the history of the universe before recombination. And, and so what's uh, suggested is that you have some sort of scalar field that causes the expansion rate to increase. And then just <coughs> at recombination, right before recombination, all where you can't yet measure, it disappears and has no effect on no, yeah. what we measure. Yeah. Um, so, and that can get you to a Hubble constant of 70 or 71 at the expense of making the sigma eight tension worse, but it can't get you right now to 73 or 74. Mm -hmm. That turns out to be very difficult. And so what I like about that model is that it's very testable because polarization measurements of the microwave background, if this is a real mm. effect, the, it will show up in polarization measurements of the next generation of experiments. And so right now it's a two or three sigma effect that mm -hmm. might allow for this. It should be 40 sigma if this is really happening yeah. and it will be <coughs> obvious one way or the other, is this a problem, you know, can, can it be solved mm -hmm. or not? So that, that's, if it's real. That can be tested, that can, can be, be tested. Yeah, exactly, yeah. It may not turn out to be the reason. Maybe somebody else will come up with a good reason, but literally there are over a thousand papers that have tried to explain this, and so far you can't. And that's interesting. Turns out to be really hard to break lambda CDM, and we don't yeah. understand. Oh. So the you know the DM, the the dark matter or the dark energy that's part of lambda mm. CDM, we don't have a fundamental understanding yet of what the dark matter actually is. We don't know what is causing the acceleration. And now we're asking another question is, is there additional like, physics yeah, yeah, that we don't that, that, yet understand? Yeah, exactly. yeah, but, yeah. but that's a model that fits a, a wide range of data really well. The microwave background, the supernovae, the matter fluctuations. So it, it's interesting to see how well it works, even though we don't understand it at a fundamental physics level yet. So if you're then going to the, to the astrophysical side with the, with the stars and the uh, standard candles that uh, you're working on, Things are not, you know, strongly coupled in that way. I'm sure that there is a lot of freedom, right? You you mentioned a little bit. You you have to understand the atmospheres of the stars across many many, you know, scales. And and uh, so do you actually think that that's that's where the where where the solution is? Uh, in, so in I, your I think it's it's too early to say how this is going to resolve mm -hmm. because it it is a fairly big difference. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it requires that we understand our errors very well. Yeah. So we're now talking about the uncertainty in the uncertainty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and so you know there's another group that's claiming a one percent accuracy in the measurements. My view is that's very hard to obtain at the current time. So these Cepheids have different metal abundances in their atmospheres. We don't actually know what the effect on the luminosities is at the one percent level. We're also having to measure the Cepheids in regions where they're young stars, mm -hmm. so they haven't had time to diffuse away just because of random peculiar motions mm -hmm. away from the sites of star formation that have a lot of dust and also that uh, where there have been generations of new stars forming. So they're fairly high density, high surface brightness regions in the galaxy. And so that makes measuring the luminosities, luminosities of these stars pretty challenging. They overlap the images, the point spread function, you know, coming through the optics of the telescope, trying to separate the light of the Cepheid from the stars in the neighboring mm. region is, is non-trivial. And it gets worse as you go farther away in distance, right? Your resolution decreases for a fixed size of your detector. So, so there are chances to getting more stars into your field of view and then you, you simply just measure the, the yeah. long luminosity. Yeah. yeah, and that's why I'm particularly excited right now because James Webb 
Mm. Space Telescope's just been launched. We now have data from the telescope, our first data from the telescope, and it's showing that crowding effects, these overlapping of images, actually can be quite significant. So how quantitatively, that, you know, what the outcome will be, is that going to explain the difference coupled with differences in the metal abundance, coupled with how well you can measure parallaxes right now or other distances to galaxies? We're just going to have to see where that comes out. But, but I think what's exciting is that we will have data in a few years that is going to allow us to answer the question. And, and I, don't, I don't know where it's going to end up. I, you, either way, I think it's open, and either way would be interesting. Because if there's new physics, that'd be great. This is a way to get at it. But if we confirm the standard model, that's also really an important thing to do. So um, we'll see.